everyone, I'm Maya, and today I'm going to be presenting a video about talking to non-human minds and um, dolphin communication. So it's like a really short video. Um, can everyone see it? Yeah, Maya actually made this video. Yeah. Uh, can yes, I can press play? Yes. Uh -huh. Oh, um, I think I didn't share with sound. Let me do that. Okay. Now, can everyone see it? Uh, can you please make it full screen if that's possible? Uh, I don't know screen? how to make it full screen. I tried to like zoom in i could try zooming in a little bit more but i don't no, know i think that should be fine so yeah you can continue okay um i'm gonna start it did you know that dolphins are the second smartest creatures in the world the smartest creatures are humans of course but you're probably wondering how intelligent are dolphins Dolphins have self-awareness. Dolphins can recognize themselves when they are put in front of a mirror, just like us humans. They will open their mouths, stick out their tongues, and make different movements when they see themselves. In addition, dolphins have their own language and enjoy spending time with each other. Dolphin language consists of squawks, whistles, squeaks, and clicks. They also communicate through body postures, such as clapping their jaws, blowing bubbles, and caressing each other's fins. Some scientists even believe that dolphins talk to each other about different facts about themselves, such as their names, ages, and emotions, which reminds us of some other earthly creatures, humans. Just imagine two dolphins meeting each other at school and saying, hey, what's your name? I'm Leo. Nice to meet you, Leo. I'm Emma. Lastly, here are the sources that I used to make this video. So that was, um, that was the video. It's like a really short video because it's supposed to be like one of those videos that you can post on other social medias like TikTok and um, like YouTube shorts and stuff like that, where it's just like gives a lot of um, general facts to people about dolphin communication. So it will make them want to learn more about it. And um, yeah, any questions? So uh, could you expand a little bit more on why you chose the do to talk about the dolphins? I chose to talk about the dolphins because their communication is very similar to ours, especially because like they have their own language uh, like we do. And they talk about basically the same stuff we do, how we're feeling, our ages, names, and um, our communication is very similar, which is why I decided to talk about the dolphins. And um, they're actually kind of closer to like humans in that sense, like than monkeys and like um, chimps and other animals like that. Queen is asking in chat, okay, go ahead. Yeah, um, I mean, she should take the, uh, she should take Quinn's question first. So I'll, I'll do after that. Uh, Quinn, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, I'll uh, just unmute and say, so would you actually consider humans the most intelligent? Because you can't really know, can you? Maybe dolphins are the most intelligent, but... Uh, they just use it in a different way. Maybe they don't like building cities and going really fast. Maybe they like uh, using it to fish in the most uh, efficient way or, or something like that. Um, I completely agree with you. Like intelligence is technically like subjective and some people, you know, are considered smarter than others, but you're also doing it on a different scale. Like you said, like humans are more advanced in a sense in different fields because like dolphins their brains 
work faster than humans and like humans um they're like they're both smart in their own ways basically so there might not be the smartest animal but like i mean based on our egos we're gonna say that we're the smartest just because but um yeah i agree um they might not be the smartest but we consider them to be but it, it's all based on subjectiveness when it comes to the end because we're smarter in different fields um i l let me add a little bit more to this because this is really good <clears throat> and and my it's I, I really enjoyed what you did there because uh, like you say it's something that piques interest and gets people to ask questions that that's the main thing uh in communication with the public and with others it's not to give them answers it's to get them to ask questions because that's what science is it's asking the right questions and yeah it, it's kind of an amazing coincidence just yesterday i was in a session with people who studied this uh, interspecies communication their whole lives including one guy who uh, talks to bilingual uh, bonobos who speak english i mean for real it's a very small group uh the lady who had alex the parrot and and various others uh and and it's really mind-blowing but the question of and and i raised this in the chat and i want to say in general in science is your definitions um uh, what does intelligence mean uh in uh, a lot of brilliant people do amazing things cannot tie their own shoes uh it, it's so there there are so many ways of looking at it and the question here both with uh the last presentation and with this and with, with others is anthropomorphism are we really the most intelligent we say well we're smart because we can do these things but we're not very good at catching fish compared to dolphins so what does intelligence really mean uh, and in science in general, getting outside of your own bubble and looking at the bigger questions, both with all these things having to do with uh, communicating with uh, uh, alien species and with animals, that, you know, that, that, that's the big problem in science, in a sense. So you, you kind of hit on, on that. Uh, that we have to think about, uh, have to think not outside the box, but outside of our brains and bodies and look at it from the outside. It's really good. Thank you. And um, I definitely agree with that, that we should think outside of the box and think more of like the entire picture, not just a little portion of it. And because science is all about asking questions and like, those questions, some questions will never be answered, but that's the whole point of science, to research, to try to find answers, and on the way, come up with more things, more questions, and that's how, like, the best discoveries come into existence. Wait, Any other I have a question. Okay. Uh, very cool uh, video, first of all, and I'm curious about how uh, we, I mean, the scientists were able to translate the language of dolphins uh, so that we can understand that. And how do you think we can use that to communicate with aliens and understand their language if we ever meet them? Um, can you repeat the second part of your question? Sorry. So, uh, like, how, how did we understand dolphins' language? And how can we use that knowledge to understand how aliens communicate and understand alien language if we ever encounter with them? Um, the scientists use like machines that kind of um, read like the vibrations of the waters kind of and like the sounds. And that's how they translated the dolphin languages to better understand it. And I feel like we could do the same with aliens if they speak in that, like in like um, using like sound waves and stuff like that, because they could speak like differently. But I feel like it could like the same machines that we use for um, 
being able to translate dolphin language into English, we could use the same for aliens. So like using the machine learning to collect and analyze the data from dolphins and create the vocabulary for a dolphin language, maybe we can retrain those machines later on if we interact with other creatures, right? Yes. Or you could like take the machines that are used for dolphin language and you can like change them up a little bit for um, like when aliens come and we can translate their languages. And then um, there's also the question of uh, what is language and what's the difference between that and communication, you know, like bees and ants communicate. Ants use uh, scent and uh, so is that a language or, you know, there are so many different ways of looking at things. And like you said about questions, Maya, it's in research. Uh, when I found the answer to something and that's it, that's okay. But when you come up with more questions, that leads in the next grant and the next project. And that's what's really, what's really good. And so that's also with these definitions, what, what really is communication? And when you combine those, you start getting zeroing in on the answer. So it's a good way of looking at it. Yes. Um, is there, uh, is there any more questions? Yeah, well, yes, I'm going to jump in just for a minute, if we can, here real quick. Um, so one, I, I love your your short film. It's lovely. Um, I hope you keep working on it and 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 really, you know, work out any kinks you have and then share it in social media um, for your friends and family and for others who are interested in seeing it. And also explore more about, you know, the communication that we've had with other organisms on our planet. Um, with us humans alone, there's a lot, a lot that gets lost in translation, even if we speak the exact same language. I talk to people all the time who also speak English, and yet we're missing something very fundamental in our communication to each other about the messages we're sending, especially these days with things like social media and text messaging. There's a lot of variation in how we talk and how we use language. Um, one of my guests for Ask an Astrobiologist uh, just this week, Dr. Alex Lockwood joined us, and she made a really cool comment that communication is about the message being received, not the message being sent. Um, it's what's being interpreted um, by whoever is receiving it out there for aliens or even here on Earth amongst our friends or amongst people online. Maybe sometimes we're too quick to react and get angry at each other because we're not really paying attention to the message itself that was intended to be sent. Um, but I love thinking about animals. I'm actually I'm actually writing a book. I've been working on it for a very long time now. And dolphins are one of the creatures I, I consider in this in this this book that I'm working on um, about life on earth and, and what it means for alien life. And there's one cool thing about dolphins. And so I'm always hesitant to say like, you know, smarter or better, stronger, faster, weaker, bigger, smaller, those kinds of things, because there's so much variation to life as we know it. And dolphins are one of the creatures that do this really cool thing called echolocation. We know what it is. We know that they're sending out sound waves through the water it's bouncing off of stuff and coming back to them and it's telling them what, where the fish are at. They can bounce a sound wave off a fish from several miles away and bounce back to them and they know it's there. And so their, their, their vision, what they're seeing in their brains is alien to us because we don't have echolocation. Um, there, even, there are people out there who are, are trying to like make sounds and hear them and figure out things around them, but our brains aren't built that way. We just, we cannot physically do it. But dolphins do it, bats do it, all of moths and butterflies do it. Um, and so it's entirely, utterly alien to us, their level of perception. And so I, I think, and I, I love your talk about dolphins. I would definitely suggest, like, look a bit more into what echolocation is and, and whether or not you think that's very intelligent for them. And then remember that we can't do that ourselves. We don't have that capability. Um, and then, you know, you can start exploring some of the other ways that we perceive the world around us. Our vision and hearing, you know, are just a few things. There's touch and taste, ways that we interpret the world. There's messages all the time being sent out, not just by, by living things, by, by non-living things as well. And what we really are, we are just instruments detecting the world around us. And it's telling us what's out there. And, and dolphins and all other living things are, are pretty much the same way. Um, and it has a lot to tell us about what aliens might be like. And so I wonder, you know, from your own perspective, if you had to guess what aliens might be perceiving, 
do you think like vision or hearing or touch or taste might be the most important? Can you imagine maybe another kind of sense and what they might be perceiving? Um, I think aliens would, it would probably be like touch, maybe smell, maybe they'd have like a like really keen sense of smell. Um, possibly sight, but I feel like they might also have a different sense where they could like maybe something cool, like where they can touch something and they would feel it and smell it through their hands or through like any part of their skin in any sense like that. But um, I think like the ones that would be like most, like they would use the most would probably be um, touch, smell, and eyesight. Probably not that much taste because they probably wouldn't have to eat that much in my opinion because like in space well from our knowledge there's not like that much like food at least for humans so I don't really think they'd be eating that much so yeah okay so... I guess it really depends on the planetary conditions in which they evolved right maybe they have electroreceptivity so they can feel the electrical fields or maybe it's a highly if it's a highly radioactive planet maybe they will know you know will be able to measure and sense the level of radioactivity or something else that we cannot even imagine. Yes. Yeah. And and <clears throat> let's remember too that our what we refer to as our senses <clears throat> is just the way we happen to pick up the data that's out there. So what we think of as visual, what we have for sight, that's electromagnetic radiation. It's not the only way to uh, pick up that data. And in fact, we do it in other ways, because when you go out in the sun and you feel warmth on your body, that's an infrared radiation detector there. So there are different ways of detecting the same things. So we have to get kind of nerdy and think about all of this as data and different ways that people will, will, if we bring it in and put it together in an array in our brain, we call it vision, but there are other ways of using that data too. And we do it, you know, like was presented earlier with Jay West and, and other things. <clears throat> so uh, again, with, with this, because we're really talking about other species, which could be, and I agree completely with Graham that, 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 uh, that communication is, doesn't even work very well on our own planet between species. Uh, and <clears throat> so it, it, it's, it's really, we have to think, I keep going on about this, but that's from a, a, a lifetime of doing research is that you really have to think about these other possibilities and break it down. Data is used to make pictures, but it's made also presented in other ways. So it could be detected and represented in other ways, just like the dolphins do. Uh, sound is detection of uh, vibrations in the medium we're surrounded by, whether it's water or air. Um, and there are other ways that animals use that too. So there are a lot of variables here, but we got to think uh, again outside of our own experience. Yeah, I completely agree, which is really hard to do, especially because like we're already used to everything here on earth so when we're thinking of things like that are possible outside of earth it's like it's like huge outside of earth there's so many different possibilities so it's hard to like picture like one specific thing that's like we think will definitely or at least most likely happen in like that um galaxy or planet etc yeah it's it, it's the hardest thing to do because <clears throat> we we evolve to think about things in the way that works best for us and that's survival and thinking of other alien ways or what other animals do. It doesn't make any sense. We're not built for that. We're not wired for that. And the other part of that is when you come up with a new idea, nobody else is gonna accept it because it's alien to them. Uh, and, and probably Julia and Graham uh, know this book, uh, Thomas Kuhn, The, the uh, Nature of Scientific Revolutions which is written, I think, in the 1950s. But if you want to understand this process, it's a really great book. It's short and neat, and I recommend it to everybody. OK, thank you. I will definitely check out the book. Um, any other questions?
you know, let's ask Rabia, Kashish, and Dani, who were sitting silently all this time, if they have any comments. Hi, everyone. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I joined a little bit late today because of some internet connectivity issues. But yeah, like the presentations were great. Like you kids are so curious and want to explore so much. And that's so great, you know. And yeah, so I have been working with Julia since last year. And I have been seeing these kids that are full of curiosity. They want to change the world. And I guess like uh, if these kids are there, then our future of Earth might be a bright one. <laughs> yeah, so great work, everyone. And by the way, I'm Kashish from India. So nice to meet you all. Thank you so much, Kashish, for the encouragement. Thank you. And Rabia, do you want to say something? Hi everyone, uh, I'm Rabia, I'm from Pakistan. I'm also a science communicator and I teach uh, young kids here astrobiology. I'm so proud to see all of you presenting uh, such difficult topics in, in such a, you know, um, easiest manner that uh, it's very easy for, I think, it will be easier for even uh, people who have no idea about what astrobiology is and what uh, all these topics are about. And it makes me feel very happy uh, to see young people, uh, you know, really uh, doing science communication. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rabia. And Rabia is an amazing teacher and science communicator. She started an astrobiology education program in Pakistan and reached out to more than 4,000 students right now, right, Rabia? So. Yes, now, now around 5,000. Wow. Because the fifth session is starting out and I have more than 1,000 students. This is so important. Thank you. And Dani, do you want to say something? Thank you so much. Um, it's just been a pleasure to be here and listen to the young people talk about the things that are inspiring to them. Um, inspiration is so important to drive um, everything as far as your research, but maybe even just all your interests and igniting that inspiration is um, <laughs> so important. And um, hearing everybody is igniting that again for me. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Danny. So any last moment questions, comments before we wrap up? Benji? Um, yeah, um, if you did figure out the language of dolphins, what would you ask one? That's a good question. Um, I would probably ask, um, like questions on how, like why they interact the way that they do. Since we do act, interact pretty similar, I could ask them like questions about like, oh, why do you guys like spending time with each other? Why do you guys um like you know um feed uh like the mom feeds the child like with us humans? And we could like ask more about um I could ask more of those types of questions, or I could also ask um other questions like um how do you guys communicate like with what Mr. Graham said? How do you guys communicate with um, the echo? I forgot the, the like echo communication, I'm pretty sure it is, where they um, use radio um, sound waves through the water to find the fish. So you could ask them about their different types of communication or like more questions on how they're so similar to us. You know what? I would think about what would the dolphins ask us 
and the mind boggles. Like, what's it like being stuck on the land all the time? And all these other questions from their point of view. They probably be, wonder what it's like being so dumb too. <laughs> that would definitely be cool as well for the dolphins to ask us questions. 